Thank you, Miguel. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I'm going to do a little different talk than I usually do tonight, just because I think the crowd is probably in agreement with what we're saying for the most part. So I will speak to you <laughs> and give you some of my thoughts about what we might do about these. I will give you a little bit of information about California and what we're ch ta tackling here just for the benefit of having that information. So I am the California Director for Food and Water Watch. We're a national public interest group. We don't take any corporate money, any government money. We are uh, at the front lines at the battle with big ag and big oil, uh, and also fighting the water wars, which are very closely related. And, um, and really, it's a battle for democracy and our government, as far as, as, far as I can tell. Um, I've been with Food and Water Watch for about 11 years, and um, as, uh, as challenging as things seem to be, I'm actually optimistic. I think you've got to be optimistic to do this work. Otherwise, uh, you know, why not just join the other side and make a ton of money and to say to hell with it all. But I think, you know, we have this responsibility, this consciousness that humanity is worth fighting for, perhaps. And um, we can hopefully have a good time along the way and build some community as we try to do something better and different. A little bit about California. California is in the news a lot of these days because we have a governor who is apparently uh, taking on President Trump. Uh, the reality is he and Trump have much more in common uh, with respect to their relationship to the oil companies than they have indifference. Um, here in California, Governor Brown has refused to ban fracking, has supported the oil companies in uh, increased drilling operations, he even fired Schwarzenegger's appointee uh, at the behest of oil lobbyist and former Governor Gray Davis uh, and replaced the uh, regulator with a pro-oil regulator uh, and then bragged about it at a forum in Silicon Valley. Uh, this year, he extended a corporate cap and trade system that was supported by the oil industry and helped written by the oil industry in which they are granted enormous allowances to keep polluting and essentially it's a pay to pollute system. This is a new corporate response to climate change. Is let's just try to uh, make some money off it and get people sh to shut up by just giving them some money. It's a very clever strategy. And now Brown is going around the world saying we need a global cap and trade system. He's going to China. He's going to the European Union that where he just was last week saying how can we have a global cap and trade system in which we have a new marketplace where oil companies and other companies can buy and sell pollution credits and other people can speculate on them and we can have an offset system uh, where these companies can uh, buy uh, offset credits which in theory reduce pollution elsewhere while they continue to keep emissions high in California. Now, California has the second, high, not per capita, but overall has the second highest uh, pollution greenhouse gas emissions in the country. After what state do you think is number one? Okay, everybody knows it's Texas. No, never, absolutely. Um, we're the third largest oil producing state uh, in the nation. Have been for a long time. Uh, names like Getty, Chevron, uh, California oil corporations. Uh, um, Kern County, Bakersfield, is where most of the oil is in California, about two-thirds to three-quarters of the oil. But the other two big oil counties are Los Angeles, which used to be oil fields back in the day, like 80 years ago, Ventura County. Anybody here see the movie There Will Be Blood with Daniel Day-Lewis? It's a really good movie. Uh, people think that's in Texas. That is actually the story of Ventura County. Uh, and uh, in the Ojai area, which is actually a quaint little town now, but uh, that, there's some oil fields there, uh, and they're actually still looking to expand those oil fields. Um, and so oil production has been a big force here in California, though kind of confined to those areas, and of course we have Santa Barbara offshore oil drilling. Uh, we had another spill there about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, yeah, the, uh, throughout this administration, through the Brown administration, the oil companies have mostly uh, gotten their way. Um, they are polluting our, our precious water through the drought. Uh, they're taking water out of the water cycle, mixing it with toxic chemicals. And it's not just fracking. They have a whole suite of techniques that are very similar to fracking, where they are blasting uh, water and chemicals under high pressure underground. Um, uh, the latest trick 
uh, the latest problem we're seeing with the oil drilling and the fracking is they're running out of places to dump the wastewater. See, back in the day, they just dump it in pits. You know, it's, it's kind of like nuclear waste. There's not really a good solution for it. Um, and so the latest thing, so uh, after the state said, okay, you got to stop just dumping it in pits. So we have injection wells instead. Now, what's an injection well? It's when you put it way deep underground, you go through an aquifer sometimes, and it's very pressurized. And you just dump it there in a cement case and you just leave it there. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of examples of how waste is dumped that way. But they're running out of places to dump that. Um, even in, in Kern County, they take the trucks and they drive them over the mountains to Ventura County in the Oxnard strawberry plains where they grow pesticide-laden strawberries. And they actually dump the waste underneath the pesticide strawberries under the ground. <laughs> and there's a groundwater table there. So what's the latest uh, trick that the oil companies have? Well, they're actually selling it to big corporate farms so they can grow our food with it. Um, Chevron uh, and a few others have a contract with two irrigation districts in Kern County. One is called the Coelho Irrigation District, one is called the North Curtain Water Management District, where they are receiving toxic wastewater from the oil field, blending it with some of their other water, taking a few walnut shells to scoop up the goop from the oil, and they are blending it and either applying it directly through the irrigation system or in one district's case, they're using it to recharge the groundwater. Now in North Kern, that is where Grimway carrots grows a ton of carrots, including organic baby love carrot, bunny love, not baby love, bunny love uh, carrots, and they, they deny it, but there's, there's documentation that the groundwater there is being recharged with this water. Also, the other big players are the Wonderful Company, which grows Halo's mandarins, and they brag that they're non-GMO, by the way. But uh, Halo's mandarins, Wonderful Almonds, Wonderful Pistachios, and Palm Wonderful. Uh, the Wonderfuls are owned by two billionaires in Beverly Hills named Stuart and Linda Resnick, which are also in the business of privatizing the state's water. Um, now, what's interesting is a good deal for the farmers because through the drought, we heard a lot of complaining that, oh, our poor little farmers in the Central Valley, and some of them did suffer, not to be really fair and real about it, but these big corporate farms always play that game, right? And so it is our perception that as the, well, the fact is that as the drought got worse, agricultural production, did it go down? Did they have to cut their water use like everybody else? No, no, it went up. And actually almond and pistachio there is an empire of almond pistachios in the last 10 years in California. More than, way more than ever before. You know, it used to be that cute little Chico Northern California crop. Oh, this tasty, and they're really good. I like almonds. Um, but they went crazy planting almonds and pistachios on the west side uh, of the Central Valley, in particular down the I-5 corridor. Uh, and those are big water suckers, man. You have to keep those trees uh, irrigated year round. Uh, and they've been over pumping the groundwater massively. The land has been sinking 30, 40 feet. Uh, and in some of these places, so they got, because the drought was bad, there was a little bit less water coming from the Delta because they're pumping water away from San Francisco Bay. And so it was very convenient for Chevron and some of these other oil companies just to give it pretty much, we don't know how much they're charging them, but it's a very convenient solution for the oil companies to give it to their friends, the big ag companies. And this is a, a practice that they want to expand. There is no regulation uh, on this at the statewide level. It's pretty, even though it's been happening kind of quietly in a small way for 15 years, it's now being expanded. There is a task force that's looking about it because of public concern. But I can tell you, big ag and big oil continue to run Sacramento for the most part. Um, they have actually successfully fought off any groundwater regulation in California for the last 20 years for the most part. There's now a pretty, in our opinion, a pretty weak bill where they have to come up with a plan to start managing groundwater. But you just come up with a plan, and a lot of the troublemakers are the ones coming up with the plan. Um, but big ag and big oil are very powerful in California. So. Um, let me see what else. I wrote some notes that I wanted to come. So we have an oil industry uh, with a lot of problems here. We have an agricultural industry with a lot of problems. And now they have this kind of toxic marriage. So um, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, the politics and, and the need, how we're going to fix this stuff. Because I know here in California, that's my world. But you know, we can apply it very locally and globally. California, we got to get our house in order. And we have to, to really change these things. We have to really take over politics and government. And I, I don't think there's really any other way. 
Um, there's a temptation to break away from it all and just create a utopia somewhere. I know there's been that uh, experiments in history. Um, and I can understand that. Sometimes I feel that way too. But I don't really think there's an escape from all this stuff. I mean, we're, we're a small planet now. We see what's going on with the climate and with greenhouse gas emissions, as Marsha was talking about. Uh, I'll be very clear. And the scientists have been very clear. They don't quite say it almost as poignantly as I wish they would. If we don't get off of oil and gas, if we don't stop drilling for oil and gas and coal, we are going to have serious, serious problems. Of course, the poor will be harm the worst first, you know, the, the, and, but it, there's no choice. Either we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. And yes, they're the most powerful corporations in the world, but we have to start here at home in California and at the local level electing people who are going to fight for the agenda that we need to get off of oil and gas. Uh, and there's just no, there's no shortcut. There's no technological fix. Um, and so I want to invite everybody to consider that, that do we have people, does your San Francisco County Supervisor, if you, or your city council member, wherever you live, is your state assembly member with us fighting for us on these issues? Is your state senator fighting for us on these issues? When you're in meetings, what I found, with, it's oftentimes there's agreement, yeah, I agree with you, yeah, it's a problem, I agree with you on the policy. But are they actually prioritizing it in their legislative and their political agenda? Is it at the top of their list? For what I've seen in Sacramento, for 99%, it's not. We'll get people who will vote if somebody else will do it. But is actually, are they actually pushing that, and are we pushing them to do it? I, well, from what I've seen around the Bay Area, we have a long ways to go. We have a very uh, important election for those of you in the East Bay uh, for the State Assembly next year. And there's going to be a lot of choices there. And the question is there is not who's got the best personality, who's got the best presentation, who makes me feel the best, is are they completely independent financially? Are they going to fight for this when they're in Sacramento? It's, it's not the, the more sophisticated movements say we are electing people, but we are electing them to do X, Y, and Z. And that's negotiated up. That's up front. There's no mystery. Eh, maybe they're going to do it. Eh, maybe they're less worse than that other person. And that's going to be better, and we're going to make a, a, a basic in, incremental change. That's not where you're, that's, we're, we're past that. And I, and I think a lot of, uh, I'm actually encouraged by a lot of citizen groups and uh, political groups that are springing up since the election. Uh, that's why, in some ways, I'm actually more optimistic, because that's what it's going to take. Isn't it? And it's going to take that level of involvement and constant pressure if we're going to have a democracy, if it's going to work. And so I think everybody's woken up since the election like, oh, we got some big problems and they didn't just all spring up. They've been happening for the last 30 years. A lot of them have been worsened since Reagan got elected and have been kind of on a, wor a corporate takeover path. So that, that's, what, that's what I'm feeling. That's what I'm saying. So at Food and Water Watch, uh, one of the things we're doing, we have, we're a C3, like, like all y'all nonprofits, you know, Tax, ex uh, tax exempt money, but we, we do have a C4 arm that we're building up. It's not tax exempt, but uh, it's a vehicle for us to get involved with more politics. So we're going to be looking at some races around California where we want to elect champions, champions who are going to ready to fight to get the state off of fossil fuels, uh, to have a truly renewable economy uh, and, and society, and uh, to take on the abuses of big ag in California and to have, have a sane and sustainable uh, farm policy. Um, it's going to be a heck of a fight. But I, what? I, and while we're looking at a couple of legislative races, and legislative races are big in California, you look at the state of New York, they have about the same amount. No, they actually have more state legislators than we do. And their population is about almost half of our population. We have these crazy Byzantine laws. So what does that mean? We have less democracy, right? Because one assembly member represents a lot more people here. And so it's actually harder for us to elect champions because we have a bigger playing field. I mean, bigger uh, amount of voters and then the way the media works and all that worries. So money does create an advantage. But we can win. We can win. And Bernie showed that you can win. I mean, Bernie outraised Hillary for a few months. I think you all remember that. So some people say, oh, we're never going to win until we get corporate money out of politics. Yeah, we have to win. We have to, that's part of the agenda. We have to win to get the money out of politics. We can't just wait. It's not going to happen. We have to make that happen. It's part of our agenda. So 
I, my, what I'm feeling is at every elected level, we start getting people who are going to fight for us on these issues. And, and at the very local level, school board, city council, county supervisor, state assembly, state senate to member of Congress. And if we all do that, if we all start doing that around California, then that's how we're going to start being able to change policy. I want to finish with a quote, which I really like this quote from a guy named James Farmer, who worked very closely with Martin Luther King. And he said, if we do not save the environment, then whatever we do in civil rights, this was in the 50s when he said this, then whatever we do in civil rights will be of no meaning, because then we will have the equality of extinction. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, during the past all, not all international conference, we have Adam Scott speaking, but also we have as a plenary speaker, Winona Heather, who is the executive director of Food and Water Watch, and she gave me this book. I have another one that is called Foodopoly that is a very good description of the corporate control of the food system, but this talks about the corporate control of the oil industry, specifically who is fracking in California and other states.